Alright. Uh, yep, all set. <clears throat> Alright, welcome back. I see at least some of you are entertained enough to come back for the second part of our lectures here. Uh, so remember last time we talked all about the magical wonders of light trapping and solar cells. And so a nice natural extension of that is the problem of light extraction. <clears throat> so what's interesting is being good at the one actually makes you pretty good at the other. Uh, that's what happened with me, where I did my PhD in all this fun light trapping and solar cells. And there's a startup company called Terahertz Device Corporation that came to me and said, we are making infrared LEDs and we're having a problem of getting the light out of them and everything you did is relevant to this, so can we come bring you on? Uh, so it's a pretty interesting perspective of saying, you know, here's the exact same physics, just kind of reversing the flow of light one way or the other, but all the, the fundamental rules still kind of work out the same, uh, but with a few little twists and turns that we'll talk about in a bit. So we'll start from the, the basic philosophical foundation again. Uh, remember last time we had this notion of here is just some thing in space and we're throwing photons at it. You want to count up how many photons are being absorbed inside of it versus bouncing away or passing on through. So now we have just the exact opposite. Somewhere inside this little object of interest, a photon is being emitted. <clears throat> it's just going to randomly spit out in some direction and bounce around inside of this thing. And eventually it will either get out and fall, uh, fall off into the environment somewhere, or if it keeps bouncing around in here too long, it might get reabsorbed. So our goal is to quantify that notion of light leaving the thing relative to the total light being in general of that, which we call the light extraction efficiency. Wait, the max is full screen. Oh, yeah, full screen? Yeah. Oh, much better. Thank you. So remember, we had light trapping efficiency last time, so now it's light extraction efficiency. So what are some applications for light extraction? And I have racked my brain to try and think of applications. Like remember last time we had stealth and solar cells and then anechoic chambers, all these sort of light trapping ideas. I the only thing I can think of for this is honestly LEDs. And maybe if you, you argue very loosely, an antenna could sort of qualify as that same sort of notion. So if somebody can think of something beyond <laughs> light emitting diodes that fits this application, I would like to hear it. Um, but I guess it kind of makes sense because a solar cell and an LED are essentially the same device just kind of operating backwards. So the solar cell, photons come in and current comes out. And then with an LED, its current goes in and photons come out. Uh, so I guess it makes sense to see LEDs here. But I can't really think of any sort of broader abstraction where this really makes a whole lot of sense. So essentially, we're going to talk about LEDs for the rest of this lecture. Uh, so let's kind of frame this in terms of some big national scale problem uh, in terms of like energy consumption. Uh, so a big, big chunk of our electrical grid is devoted entirely to just making our houses bright, or making the world bright. Uh, so light emission, light. Uh, so the, the classical tool for making dark rooms bright, I guess, is the, the simple tungsten filament light bulb. It's been our workhorse for the last, you know, 800 years or so. And there's some fun facts about light bulbs. Uh, and that is they're not terribly efficient. So the basic principle for a light bulb is that you have here a tungsten filament and you run an electrical current through it and it just gets hot. And Planck's law of black body radiation says hot things emit photons in accordance with Planck's law of black body radiation, which is this black uh, curve right here. So that is the, again, the spectral radiance now. Uh, so watts per square meter per nanometer per steradian. Don't ask me to explain the meaning of that. It's kind of weird and complicated. <laughs> um, so you have to enter, this is sort of photons being emitted as a function of angle now from some object here. So you integrate over all your directions, and then you integrate over all of uh, your wavelengths, and then you would get your watts per square meter, again, that kind of idea. Uh, so but the key feature of this is the overwhelming majority of your energy is being emitted way out here in infrared and beyond, and only a tiny little fraction of it is in the visible spectrum, which loosely speaking is around 400 to 700 nanometers. 
Uh, so if we assume that we have absolutely perfect visual reception in that visible wavelength there, we find that only 8% of the total energy being emitted falls into that spectrum. And the rest is just going into heating your house. Uh, so that's not terribly efficient. That means you take you know, the total number of gigawatts being generated by the electrical grid to make lighting. 90% of that is just going into heat, and the, re the other remaining 8% at most can be devoted to actually making the world look bright. Uh, the reality, of course, is it's even worse than that because your vision is not perfectly attuned to all these photons. Uh, you, know, you kind of imagine there's relative sensitivity of your retinas at various wavelengths. So Realistically, that 8% is probably more like 4 or 5% or less. So that's not really very good. We could take a huge dent out of our electrical bills at the end of the day if we found more efficient ways to light up our lives. No pun intended. Uh, so let's skip a, one slide ahead. <clears throat> so this is why light emitting diodes are really, really awesome. Uh, is because all of that light that was being generated in a black body you can cram it all into a very distinct wavelength and even fiddle with the spectrum of that to create uh, distinct colors. So for example, this is a spectrum that I took from just a flashlight I bought at REI, like a camping flashlight, and I put it into a photometer uh, for some project that I was working on. And this is the spectrum that came out of it. So you notice it's got this big giant peak here around the blue, then this big bulge here, uh, kind of in the green and red parts of the spectrum. It's all compact right here between 400 and 700 nanometers. So there's no energy getting lost out here in dark infrared and beyond, or even in the ultraviolet and below here. So that's really great because I can concentrate all of my energy into the spectrum that matters, and I can even you know fiddle with it to get pretty colors that I like. Uh, so this one in particular is called Cool White. Um, or if you watch Family Guy a lot, you say Cool White. Okay, some people get it. <laughs> um, you can kind of see in this room here, like you look up here, you see how this is kind of got this sort of yellowish hue to it there, and this might be a little more whitish. Um, you can do that same sort of thing with LEDs. And it's, I'd say a cool white kind of looks like this uh, sort of color up here, where that pink probably has its own name. Um, so that's pretty neat. Uh, so let's go back here. So that's one of the main reasons why LEDs are kind of amazing. You're not wasting all that energy spectrum. So let's look at the, the fundamental anatomy of an LED. Um, if you look at it, it looks a lot, awful lot like a solar cell. <clears throat> Just um, here you have the same PN junction again, only instead of light coming in to produce current, I just ram a bunch of current through it, and you have this whole magic of band gaps happening where electrons and holes are recombining, and there's a definite energy difference here between them to give off photons like that particular wavelength. And uh, if you play around with this band gap here, you can play around with the energy of the photons and thus give rise to various colors. So that's pretty cool. And here is an example. Uh, Cree, I think is the company that makes a lot of high power LEDs. And this is one of their chips that I just pulled off the internet somewhere. And they're you know, a nice little die, which means you can manufacture these things using our uh, standard uh, semiconductor infrastructure. Uh, but one of the really ni nice things about LEDs is modulation. So when it comes to black body radiation, that's really hard to send signals with because at the end of the day, you have to kind of turn the thing on and off really, really fast, which means you're limited by the time it takes for that filament to heat up and then cool down again, which is, if you're very lucky, you could get it down to tens of milliseconds, say. So that means, uh, we'll go back a slide here. If you imagine this tungsten filament here. If I wanted to send digital information or something like that, I could, at best, I might be able to squeeze out a few hundred hertz of bits per second, or a few hundred bits per second out, something like that. LEDs, on the other hand, they can turn on and off with a scale of hundreds or of nanoseconds. So that means I can get gigabits per second out of LEDs. There's a huge advantage, incidentally, to why we love LEDs. Not only can you tune the spectrum, but you can modulate them very quickly and use them for digital communication. So that's why you probably would see a lot of these sorts of things in fiber optic communications, right? Yeah. You don't see lasers too much with fiber optic. So yeah. you, you do see lasers? You probably see LEDs too? Yes. Yeah, so there's some pros and cons to that, which we won't get into. <clears throat> uh, so you can manufacture them in 
uh, very large quantities. So for example, this little chip is probably a square millimeter in size. And you imagine a wafer that's about yay big, you can easily cram out you know, 100,000 of these little chips on one single wafer. So they're pretty easy to manufacture. And of course, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency is very, very helpful. Okay, so we stuck with the spectra. So, okay, so why is it so hard to get line up LEDs? It, it sounds too good to be true, and there, there's a lot of caveats to that. And the main problem with LEDs is just because I'm creating all these wonderful photons here inside the substrate, there's no guarantee that they're actually going to get up and out here in the environment and the world beyond. <clears throat> so we'll do a quick little analysis, a broad overview of why that's so hard. So you imagine that here is an electron in a hole have recombined somewhere inside of the PM junction. And photons are just going to spit out in every which dire uh, direction as a result of those recombination events. And obviously, some of that is going to go backwards. <laughs> you can't guarantee that it will go in the direction you want. Some of it might go down towards the back contact. Uh, so that might be a problem. And because then uh, you have a chance where it might get absorbed as it goes down back there. Uh, you have your top contacts up here, of course, because I have to flow current through it. But then I have the problem of Fresnel reflection here at the surface. So that same problem where I would get light bouncing off the top, light's going to want to bounce on the bottom as well. So first things first. Uh, we'll minimize our surface contact. So this is why this is, a, this is a fun little picture of an LED here. We can see uh, here are uh, the little contacts coming in, and then there's the, the surface contact in this little grid. And they're trying very hard to not block light from getting out of there. But you can't make that too sparse because charge has to diffuse from that metal contact throughout the volume of this LED to create electron hole recombination. Um, so there's, you're, there's this battle where you want a nice heavy coverage so that all the charge fills the, the LED and glows, but you can't uh, have too much or it's just blocking the light and getting back out again. Um, but at least you can do your best and compromise, and typically you might only get 1% or 2% coverage or something like this. So that's great. So I've removed my contact here, and some light might get out of there, but I still have these reflections in the back propagation. So what do I do about that? So the next step is thinner is better. So obviously this should be intuitive because with a solar cell, thicker was better because I wanted to maximize my absorption or maximize the depth for those photons to go bouncing around and get absorbed. Now I want them to get out as quickly as I can, so I want to minimize the thickness of this, uh, this device. So that's why you typically, ideally, you want to see this on the range of, say, 1 to 10 microns. Um, whether or not it's practical to do that will depend on how you're manufacturing. Uh, but this is definitely a goal you would want. But then we still have this problem of Fresnel reflection here at the surface. So we do like we did before, and we add an anti-reflective coating, and that got rid of some of the ref Fresnel reflection, but not all of it. And so if you remember, who took 3,300 again? We've got one, two, three, four. So you have the problem of total internal reflection. Sometimes this is beneficial, like with fiber optic communication. In our case, this is now our officially our worst enemy because all those rays going out there outside of the escape cone are just going to bounce around forever and never, ever leave. So that is the fundamental problem with light extraction in a light in general. Is there any questions or are you just kind of... No, I was just thinking, just, just changing the geometry, change that. Oh, well, we'll, we'll kind of address that at the end. <laughs> but geometry is a big deal, and I have sort of a what-if slide at the end that, that addresses probably what you're thinking. Like, why not make this into a giant dome or something? Yeah. Uh, well, like, you kind of go back here. Well, let's see. We'll put back here on slide four. So, yeah, you notice it's kind of planar, but they got this domed lens thing that maybe trying to help. Um, but probably manufacturing a dome out of an LED and a semiconductor, I imagine that'd be pretty difficult. Because everything's set up to slice into nice thin wafers, mess around with that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. So just keep that thought in mind. <clears throat> uh, so where are we here? So total internal reflection is our worst enemy. And what are we going to do about it? Uh, so let's. This is a fun little graphic. <laughs> I'm kind of showing off now because I went through a lot of trouble to calculate this full field solution. So I'm going to use every excuse I can to show it off. Uh, so here on the left, uh, you imagine 
kind of a ray optics view of what's happening here, where here is this little event and it's spitting out rays in every which direction. Some of them are landing within the escape cone here, and so then they get to leave, and the rest just bounce back down. And most semiconductor materials, they have an index of refraction on the order of about two and a half to four-ish in that range. So when you do the math, that means this escape cone is really usually on the scale of about 15 to 20 degrees. So that, that, that's about approximately <laughs> the to scale of what you would see in your escape cone here. So this is now a full field calculation. Uh, I did a two-dimensional model. So over here you have a line source kind of going back and forth radiating light. And there's still that escape cone here. And you can see how some of that energy is getting up and out there. And the rest is just kind of bouncing back down underneath. So just kind of in the back of your mind, think this is really what's happening. And those rays are just kind of a way of abstractifying this uh, full field view here. But it's the same idea. All that wave propagation in here is there's an escape cone. And some of it reflects down and some gets out here. So all that reflection back down. It's basically trapped forever and eventually just turns into heat again. And instead of lighting our homes, we just make very good heaters. Um, <clears throat> so now for the rest of this, we're going to do kind of a mathematical analysis of what exactly is going on and how bad is the problem really. Uh, so interestingly enough, if you look into this problem, uh, you know, there's a few textbooks on LEDs where they kind of scratch the surface of this and they do a few simplified models of what's going on. Um, but I couldn't really find you know, a nice formal treatment of the subject from, from the first principles. So I wound up writing my own paper on the whole subject, where I just kind of tackled this problem from a full field electromagnetic perspective here, and accounting also for the directionality of the sources here. So we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. So the basic model begins with two regions here. We have region one and region two. And I guess technically we're not going to care about magnetism, so imagine these views are just one, but you usually have some index of refraction or dielectric constant represented by the epsilons here. And buried underneath region one here, there is some little current density denoted with the letter J. Uh, so if you're familiar with a lot of the advanced electromagnetics, this sort of stuff should be very familiar to you and comfortable. And if you're not, um, just ask questions or roll with it and we'll do our best. <laughs> uh, but the idea is here is what happens when an electron in a hole Combined, you have some flow of charge for a brief little moment in time that wants to radiate light. Quantum mechanically, you can think of it as a change in energy levels between the two states and a, a photon is emitted. Uh, but you can also look at this from a classical perspective. At that little moment, there is a current density that is going to radiate electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> so that J then gives rise to electric fields and magnetic fields which when you put them together, you get what's called the Poynting factor, S. And that has units of watts per square meter. So the surface integral of that S vector represents a flow of power in some given direction. So what you can do then is integrate, you know, take a surface around that and just integrate that little Poynting vector. And that will tell you uh, the total radiated power. So you can see it's just a surface integral of that S vector around this little surface here. So you, you see here we have J. There is this kind of little arbitrary box with a bunch of S vectors pouring out of it. And if you just integrate that, total radiated power there. So we're, we're still kind of in a very abstract point of view right here. But once you write down kind of a formal mathematical expression of that, you can start plugging in more precise values to see what happens. So some distance away, you have Z equals A here. So the distance is A meters in this direction. And then some of that light, we want to figure out how much of that is getting up into the world beyond. So we are now going to formally, there we go, we're going to formally define light extraction efficiency as a surface integral along the whole surface of this uh, boundary here. So you notice it's just from minus infinity to, and minus infinity to infinity in both directions. <clears throat> so over x and y, and up and down here in the z direction, and that will tell me all the power that escapes up here. And then if I divide it by the total power that was radiated here, I now have, by definition, my light extraction efficiency. So you can see here it's the surface integral here divided by total radiated power. OK, so let's start solving it for some special cases. So the simplest case that you'll find in the textbooks is that of the isotropic radiator. So that means 
energy is just spewing out from that little source equally in all directions. That's not necessarily always the case, but it is a good first order approximation. It's a nice special case to build some intuition as well. So what is the light extraction efficiency of an isotropic radiator buried underneath some particular dielectric material? And it turns out it's simply the ratio of the two solid angles. So I have some solid angle subtended by this cone that goes up inside the escape cone. And everything else is lost forever. So if we assume no reflections here, so say another one of those perfect magical and reflective coatings, then all the energy inside the escape cone leaves and then everything else is trapped forever. And what you get is a very simple expression where your light extraction efficiency is one minus the cosine of the critical angle. And then you divide by two because I think that's accounting for the fact that the bottom half of this is uh, trapping forever. So if I also had like another boundary over here at the bottom and another escape cone down there, then I believe that factor of two goes away. So that, that little one half is just going to kind of follow along because of that. So from Snell's law, the critical angle is the inverse sign of one over the index of refraction. So what you find is, say, for something like three and a half, that was silicon and for my index of refraction. It's pretty common for semiconductors, you know, somewhere between three and four. So we'll just pick a nice little representative value, and you find it's 15 degrees. That's my escape cone. Which, when we plug it into our expression, we finally arrive at a total light extraction efficiency of a whopping 1.7%. So all that work was just to tell us some very terribly bad news that this is a lousy system. <laughs> so we got all that wonderful efficiency gain by packing all of our spectrum into a nice little, uh, uh, neat little bandwidth that is only sensitive to human vision. So that gave us you know, a good factor of 10 in our efficiency improvement. But then we lost it all because I can't get any of that light to just leave the device and uh, illuminate the room. So there, there's sort of a good news and a bad news here. So the bad news is it's terribly inefficient, but the good news is there is a whole lot of room for improvement here if we're very clever engineers. <clears throat> So then, for kicks and giggles, we decided, well, what if we have a directional source? And this is kind of a big deal, because depending on how the LED is constructed, those electrons and holes may just randomly recombine in every which direction, or they may preferentially have some current density or some current moment vector oriented along some direction, which means photons are going to preferentially spew out in some directions over others, which you can see might be bad for my LED. <clears throat> So if you ever take uh, antenna theory or an advanced neon class, you will run into this thing called a Hertzian dipole. And it's kind of an idealized model for a very tiny little impulse of current. And it's nice because it has nice, has simple closed form expressions for the directionality of the energy that we're really out of. So we'll completely bypass that entire derivation and skip right to the end and say our directionality or our gain is three halves times the sine squared of the angle. So that means uh, so zero degrees is up and down. It means no energy is going to go up and down or parallel to the direction of my current, but I'll get a maximum along the broad side. <clears throat> so you can call that gain or directionality. Um, they're mostly synonymous for our purposes here. They're technically not, but in this context, you can use them interchangeably. So what happens now if my LED isn't random in its polarization, but actually has some preferential direction? Well, that can either be good or it can be get bad. So all you do is you take that pointing vector here and you plug in your gain. And then you can also weigh it by the transmittance, uh, which we'll generally ignore for now because we're assuming perfect anti-reflective coatings. So that transmittance is either zero for outside of the escape cone or it'll be one inside the escape cone. But you can actually generalize, generalize this even more by uh, putting in your uh, transmission coefficient. Which, if you took 3,300, you spent weeks and weeks dealing with that. So we'll just pretend you already know everything about that and never speak of that again. Uh, so you can see our light extraction efficiency now just is the same expression, but we're kind of weighting it by the direction that the energy is propagating. <clears throat> so let's start with the worst case. I have a Hertzian dipole and it is oriented uh, perpendicular to the surface. So that means all the energy is focused along the broad side or down. <laughs> the, the length of my LED. And you plug in all that stuff in the integral, and they're big and nasty, but you can actually solve them using a little bit of calculus, and you get a nice little closed form expression here. Um, so this, you know, one half 
plus 116 cosine, yada, yada, yada. It's a closed form expression. You dump it in the MATLAB, and you'll get a curve on that. Same thing happens. You can do the opposite, uh, the, the ideal scenario, where maybe my current density is oriented parallel to the LED and thus perpendicular with the surface. And now I'm going to radiate most of my energy up into that escape cone, which maybe will help me a bit. So you just do some coordinate transformation, and that game uh, function gets rotated around to this nasty looking thing. You dump all that into your big nasty surface integral, and I get yet another closed form expression for my light extraction efficiency. So again, just staring at that doesn't really tell you anything. You have to plot it to really see what's going on. <clears throat> so this was kind of an interesting graphic to generate. So this was, uh, this is all in my old paper here. <laughs> but again, uh, you, know, you look around in the literature, and they only do kind of a surface treatment of uh, this subject. And so this is all on Optics Express, so you can download it right now if you're really interested in all of the, that nitty-gritty derivation. But this is the graphic here. So you notice on the x-axis here at the bottom, it's critical angle <clears throat> from 0 to 90 degrees. And up on the top axis, we also just kind of, for convenience, uh, indicated the refractive index. So obviously, if the refractive index is 1, and whilst it's actually we're assuming space is uh, free space is above my LED. Um, so one corresponds to 90 degrees, which is basically like an antenna radiating in free space, which means all the light above gets uh, extracted, and so you see that corresponds to 50 percent, and everything that is radiated down gets lost forever. So hypothetically, you can multiply all this by two, say, if I want to account for uh, light going down as well. <coughs> And so you see we have our three cases. Here's the isotropic radiator here, kind of in the middle. And then we have the ideal parallel polarization for this curve. And then over here, we have the perpendicular, which is our worst case down here. And we also have two curves. One is our ideal anti-reflective, where we're, we're just assuming anything in the escape cone leaves and anything out is trapped. But if you want to, you can throw in Fresnel reflection as well. It really makes the math complicated, but you can just throw computers at it and get results. And so you can see how the Fresnel reflection just kind of takes a little bit away, but the, the basic idea is still mostly the same. So as I get towards 90 degrees, obviously I get 50% of my light extraction efficiency here, but, then, uh, but most uh, semiconductors will fall within this little range here of about, say, 15 to 25 degrees. So you just look at that and you think, ouch, everything is, you know, maybe at best I'll get 5-ish percent. Yeah, that's not very good, is it? So even if I am very clever and I somehow magically orient my LED and, uh, and, and the basic underlying semiconductor physics to try and get all those photons and electron hole pairs to realign just the way I want, I might get about 5% on my light extraction efficiency. So it, it's technically a little more than double, but it's not that great. So what can we do about that? Well. <clears throat> Another special case that's really interesting is, let's just suppose there's a back contact here and light comes down and is scattering diffusely. So you notice that same theme again where specular reflection doesn't really help us much, but uh, roughening things up so that we get diffuse reflection is a very helpful result. Uh, so we're going to imagine the same sort of idea where there's a back contact and we still have that four cosine theta thing again, which is the, the Lambertian limit the diffuse limit. And you actually get a nice simple expression. It's sine squared of the cosine, uh, critical angle. But you still, you know, even when you do the math, you're down here and you get maybe 10, 20% of my light extraction efficiency tops. Not very good. So this slide now just sort of shows a summary of the same data, just all kind of zoomed in for uh, semiconductors. So like my index of refraction is just greater than two. And you can see, okay, for my best case here, I might get uh, 5%. There's another 4 or 5%. There's like half a percent best, even in this case. And then the land version maybe gets up to 15-ish if I'm lucky. But generally speaking, we saw that 15 degrees was my critical angle for most of them. So you can see I get 6%, 1.5 here, 2-ish, uh, 2 25 two maybe, and 0.1. So that's not very encouraging. How do I get my light out now? So we're going to borrow a page from our light trapping notebook and do the same thing for light extraction and just start bumping things up. 
So specular, specular reflection is bad because it means once a ray escapes, it will escape forever. And if it doesn't escape, it just bounces around forever and nothing happens. But when you uh, add surface roughening, that means that when a ray hits that surface, some of that energy gets out and some of it reflects, but I sort of scrambled the direction of the energy is flowing so that some fraction of it, by the time it bounces back and forth again, might then actually get a chance to leave. So now instead of bouncing back and forth forever, I bounce a little, some of it leaves, I bounce some more, some of it leaves, bounce again, and some leaves. So eventually, if they just bounce around long enough, all that light's going to get out. The only caveat to that is I can't absorb too much energy inside my substrate here. Otherwise, as I bounce back and forth, I just lose all the energy. <clears throat> We're going to quantify that a little bit. So this was another paper I kind of threw out kind of as a conference paper as a follow-up to this whole light extraction thing. Or we say, okay, what happens if we do some Lambertian scattering and then follow all those rays again? So the first question is, how much light do I lose on a single back and forth reflection? So we'll call that an absorption factor again. <clears throat> and you see it's the same nasty integral we saw the other day where you have this e to the minus 2 alpha w secant thing. So that uh, alpha is our attenuation coefficient for the material. W is the thickness. The secant theta accounts for the angle uh, with respect to the normal. Uh, so a perfectly up and down would be zero degrees. And then at 90 degrees, that secant term goes out to infinity, obviously. And then the two just represents the back and forth distance that I had to propagate. And then, of course, you have all the uh, leftover bookkeeping in my uh, polar coordinates that I have to deal with as well. And I think the cosine theta term here represents the diffuse scattering again. And then this is my uh, Jacobian stuff over here. <clears throat> so it, it's big and it's ugly, but again, you just throw computers at it and start plotting it. And you get these nice little curves here for various uh, attenuation coefficients here. Uh, so these are kind of representative values for most uh, semiconductors at the extreme high and extreme low end. Most stuff tends to kind of fall around, I guess, maybe the 10 to 100-ish. And you see this is a function of the slab thickness and how much of that energy is going to get absorbed with a single back and forth bounce. So naturally, as my slab gets really, really thick, I just lose all of my energy no matter how absorptive I am. Uh, because it's infinitely thick, you just would lose all your energy. So eventually, you have this little transition where it now goes down to zero because if it's infinitesimally thick, you would obviously lose nothing no matter how lossy it is. And then there's this kind of nice little smooth curve that transitions from the one to the other. So that's a nice little starting point because it gives us an idea of how much loss can we really tolerate before none of this even matters. <clears throat> or at the very least, given some loss, how thin do I have to be in order to make this worth my time? So then you imagine, okay, some light goes down and it goes back. I lost a little bit to absorption. And then a tiny little bit is going to escape out of the surface with the rest reflecting back down again. So that same idea that we did with that whole Dublonovich Lambertian limit uh, from last time, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're just tracking the energy as it bounces around back and forth. So then you ask, okay, how much of that energy is going to escape up into the, uh, the world beyond here? So we'll call that an extraction factor. Why not? And so again, it's this transmittance here with this e to the minus something. So this is accounting for my attenuation as I go back and forth. And then this is um, whether how much of that fraction is going to escape into the world beyond when it hits the surface here. And if you want to do a very rough approximation, you can basically just treat this as saying it roughly the fraction of light that gets into the escape cone relative to everything else will escape. And that's, that's kind of a nice hand wavy randomization to it. But if I had sort of a fixed deterministic perspective of this surface, I could even uh, use this transmittance function here. Uh, so there, there's the publication there, often uh, proceedings of the SPID. If you really want to see some of the nitty gritty details. Um, again, it's, it's big and it's ugly, but it's tractable. You can just do some numerical integration on that and let MATLAB deal with the rest for you. And you get simple little curves that maybe look like this. So for this particular example, we did I did kind of a deterministic calculation using uh, <laughs> this uh, FDTD simulation with these cones here. But you can kind of uh, do, say, an approximation to a randomly rough surface and get the same results. And at the time, uh, the big semiconductor of interest for me was gallium antimonide, which is what we're using for our infrared LEDs. 
which happen to have an attenuation coefficient of four meters, four per centimeter. Right? That's the, the unit there. And this is really useful because the wafers that we started with to make our LEDs, I believe, were something like half a micron thick. So that, that doesn't, or sorry, not a half, but half a millimeter. So what that says is, you know, that's actually pretty thick for something like this, which means even if I did all the perfect things up here on my surface, it wouldn't matter because I'm just going to lose all my energy in the back and forth bouncing. If, however, we could polish that thing and grind it down to, say, 100 microns or 50 microns, then all of a sudden you're, you're coming up on the high end of this curve and it becomes worthwhile to do all this uh, magical surface texture. <clears throat> and so all you do is you take all that back. Sorry, I I kind of skipped my uh, final result here. Uh, so you do an infinite series and all that bouncing back and forth, and you actually get a pretty simple expression uh, in my light extraction efficiency, which you'll notice is just the extraction factor divided by extraction plus the absorption. So it's a, a closed form geometric series, which is pretty neat. <clears throat> uh, so, but that's that's one of the take-home points here is if I uh, start off with a wafer that's really really thick, maybe uh, it just tells me how much I have to grind it down before any of this stuff becomes worthwhile. And that's exactly what we did. We started with these big giant wafers and as part of our uh, processing, we had them polished. And I, I don't remember how thin we got them, but th there was definitely some uh, mechanical constraints here. Because you can't polish the wafer forever, because eventually as it starts getting below 100 microns, the, the material is, just starts shredding itself to bits, right? So that was a big problem for us in terms of our manufacturing. Uh, we can see, okay, if I want to make this work, this is what we've got to do, and it's nice to be able to throw hard numbers at it um, to tell whether or not this stuff is worthwhile. But you can see as I get very, very thin, all of a sudden we're getting up 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100% on the light extraction efficiency, which is not bad. <clears throat> so let's look at the parallels here between light trapping and light extraction. So light trapping, we want to get light in, light extraction is to get light out. It's the same physics, different direction. In both cases, we found that anti-reflective coating is good because there's that barrier as light hits the dielectric uh, boundary, we're going to get Fresnel reflections. And so when it comes to solar cells, I want as much energy to get into that cell as I can. Otherwise, anything that initially bounces away is lost forever. And the same thing happens in an LED that when light hits that boundary, it can either reflect back in and be absorbed, or it can get out there into the environment. So anti-reflective coatings are generally a good thing. Um, with light trapping, we found that attenuation is our friend, and we're generally trying to uh, maximize that attenuation if we can. Uh, but we also found with light extraction that attenuation is our enemy. Because again, with light trapping, I want that light to just bounce around and get absorbed really, really quickly. With light extraction, I want that light to bounce around and not get absorbed until it has a chance to escape. Uh, light traffic. Thick films are better, up to a point. And then, of course, light traction thin was better. And then in both cases, we found that surface roughening was very, very helpful. And the reason seems to be, you know, you imagine there's this escape cone where some of the light can either get out through that or bounce around forever. But if everything were perfectly specular, any ray that leaves the LED will be gone, but anything trapped inside is just going to be stuck. But when you bump up your surfaces, every time a ray strikes that surface, some of that energy, all that energy is re-scrambled in every which direction again. So that I'm not necessarily trapped forever, but every time I bounce back and forth a little bit, it has a chance to keep escaping and then re-randomizing again. <clears throat> so surface roughening seems to really be nice in both cases because it does the same thing in a sense. When we're trapping light, the roughening allows me to keep scattering more and more light into the inside of the inside of the solar cell. And then with light extraction, the roughening keeps allowing me to redistribute the energy back into those escape points and get it back out. So it's kind of neat to see how some of your things are opposite and some of your things are actually the same. So in closing, I'm just going to do another one of those wacky thought experiments. This is what you were kind of asking about before. Is why don't we do some wacky geometry like this? <laughs> And believe it or not, this was a discussion I had with my boss. Was like, why don't we make our LEDs in little spheres or something? Wouldn't that just solve all of our problems? <clears throat> so this is, again, one of those things you'll have to sit down with your boss and say, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Or what would it take to make this work? Or what are all the things that would go horribly wrong if we tried to do this? 
So this is now the part where you guys just brainstorm and tell me if this is smart or dumb. Well, how would you know it to anything? So that, yeah, that's the first weird question is, you know, it's just gonna like, where's my power supply gonna come in? I need my surface contacts. Uh, where's my back contact, right? So like, I guess maybe I could have my positive contacts over here and my negative contacts here, and then all the current would kind of just flow that way. But I don't know, I'd probably have hot spots in the middle and not so much around here, but maybe that would kind of work. Uh, here's another question. You might be able to use yeah. inductance to get Inductance? Right. Well, you need charge to physically flow in this thing in order to get those electrons and holes to recombine. Inductance, like right. that's yeah, actually yeah. a really wacky. I never thought of like, what if you did some kind of uh, eddy current thing where I put this in a magnetic field, so I'm just forcing all these eddy currents to flow around inside this thing. Um, well, having been working with eddy currents for the last five years, I can tell you that would be really, really difficult because the conductivity of most semiconductors is very, very, very low. I mean, it's it's decent. Um, but in order to get an appreciable flow of the eddy current, you need a very high frequency magnetic field, and then you would also need a very strong magnetic field, and you would need a big giant electromagnet in here somewhere in order to <laughs> excite all of this thing, right? Yeah, and then probably block the line. <laughs> no, that would be an interesting toy, though, if something figured it out, where it just sort of glows as you get. In fact, it would probably be easier to just have a big loop of wire out here and use that to, as a Faraday flaw to excite my, uh, my, my contacts. So a big giant coil external here, which actually is a toy you could make right now. You take an LED with just a big coil and then excite that with an electromagnet. You probably see it better. But uh, I, don't, I get a hunch that wouldn't be the most efficient way to deliver energy in life. Yeah, I think so. I've, I've seen flashlights that you yeah. know, do that. They have the coil mm -hmm. and the actual handle, and then they have a magnet that slides up and down. And you shake it and get a charge. And then... Well, that's used to charge the battery, which is then used to just drive the LED. Yeah, I guess that's true. <clears throat> uh, well, I don't know. Any other problems you might see with this? Just brainstorm something. <laughs> what do you think? That's it, just contacts. Can't think of anything else that might go horribly wrong with this. Uh, what if my electron and my hole recombine over here away from the center? Then what happens? Because the closer and closer I get to one of these surfaces, the more and more this will start to look like a flat planar boundary, won't it? Which means my escape cone will only be you know, a small little window here, and everything else here is going to get trapped in there. <clears throat> So it works really well for all the photons being emitted towards the center, but it won't work very well for everything out here at the edge. You know, still have kind of the same problem. So that's another issue. Uh, another thing I would think of is I can't even begin to imagine how you manufacture something like this because I have to I have to put a PN junction in here somewhere, and somehow you have to grow the the semiconductor into this. This sort of shape because usually what we do is you have like the thin little wafers and everything is just nice and planar. Yeah, that's so what I was thinking. <laughs> from a fabrication point of view, this is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> so just like I can't even begin to say how would you make that. Um, but those are those are the big things that jump out at me from all that. Um, you know, but yeah, doping the PN junction maybe would be an issue. Uh, but there's also another question of let's go back here. Look back here. Let's suppose I just made that exact same thing with a bumpy surface, and it was about 10 microns thick. What is my light extraction efficiency going to be? I don't know if you look at that. We're up there, maybe 80-ish percent. <laughs> so if I've already got 80% just by using a nice flat planar structure, then at best, I might squeeze out another 20% from this configuration. So that, that's, this is sort of that theme I was alluding to last time we were here, is just because maybe this is better, is it really better? I, all I've done is squeeze an extra 20% of juice out of this, 
but how much more effort did it take me to now construct this? I have to like build, reinvent an entire you know semiconductor fabric fabrication process just to build these little pellets, all so that I can squeeze 20% more light out of them, or I could just use all the infrastructure we have right now and just do this stuff and get kind of most of it out already. So why not leave it at that? Or maybe this particular example we used gallium antimonide, which had this particular attenuation coefficient. Is that necessarily going to be true for gallium arsenide or indium gallium phosphide or whatever other materials are used for LEDs, right? Maybe I have, I don't know, indium phosphide. Maybe it's got half the attenuation coefficient. Maybe we could just use that instead. And now I just you know kind of double my extraction by using a better semiconductor. I didn't have to change anything else. <clears throat> So kind of the moral of the story is sometimes these ideas are great and they lead to all sorts of wonderful groundbreaking progress. Sometimes they might look really great on paper until you think about it and realize, oh, you know, I'm just throwing tens of millions of dollars over something that is only going to squeeze me a 20% extra boost. Yeah, that. Because <clears throat> again, you know, it only really works for the stuff in here and then I have all this stuff out here. So maybe at best I can get like 80 or 90% light attraction out of that anyway. So for all I know, if I haven't done the math yet, maybe I don't even gain anything. So those are just some, some things to think about. Maybe it's a good idea and you can make it work and you'll, you'll get rich and famous for doing it. Or maybe it's wildly impractical and it's a bad idea. And you're going to have to face these questions all the time as you do research and development in your, your, your future careers. So uh, those are just fun thought experiments I like to do. Any other questions before we close up today? And if not, then right, thank you for thank you for listening. And hope to see some of you in numerical methods next semester. <laughs>